full paper sessions at the West Conference, you'll see that in 2019, there were three dedicated sessions for both fabrication and ARVR. The following year, five for fabrication and six for ARVR. And the same numbers in 2021. So given this growing interest, I think it's really interesting to identify common challenges and opportunities and to think about why the two fields have attracted so much attention. Although the two fields deal with different technical challenges, both aim for a single goal, creating objects instantly, either by fabricating them physically or rendering them virtually. In this panel, we will examine the pros and cons of both approaches discuss which one may, may prevail in the future and what opportunities exist for closer collab collaboration between researchers from the two fields. So the vision of computationally creating things on demand goes back to the 1960s when Ivan Sutherland proposed his concept of the ultimate display, a room where the computer controls the existence of matter. The computer is, is basically in charge of rendering the environment and generating more content dynamically. And actually, several of you have identified the similarity between fabrication research and VR slash haptics, haptics research based on the ultimate display vision on academic Twitter. So thanks, Yudai, if you're here for your comments. <laughs> <laughs> we can actually see the similarity by looking at different applications in different industries. For example, in architecture, a low fidelity model could be 3D printed, or a digital model could be rendered in AR to experience a building before it is built. In medicine, surgeons can practice an operation by 3D printing phantoms or by using VR headsets before performing it on, an, on the actual patient. The same can be said of different applications for products design where experiencing and testing prototypes is crucial. Let's talk a bit about the origins and evolution of the two fields. For fabrication, the first 3D printer goes back to 1984. Years later, the expiration of associated patents resulted in the democ democratization of additive manufacturing. And today, we have several young companies, such as Carbon 3D, offering the vision of super fast fabrication, which is really exciting. For AR and VR, it is fair to say that Ivan Sutherland invented the first video headset, which he called the Sword of Damocles. It was a very heavy device. As you can see, it was suspended from the ceiling. Of course, with the advances of semiconductor manufacturing and computer graphics, things have changed. Today, there is a huge excitement about this field. You know, recently, Facebook rebranded itself as Meta to show its commitment to building the future of social AR and VR. All right, so without further ado, I'd like to pass it on to our amazing panelists um, so that they can introduce themselves. We'll start with Benko. Thank you. So, hi, everybody. My name is Herboya Benko. Most Folks know me just as Benko. Uh, I'm currently a director at, um, at Meta. I direct the research science, uh, specifically focusing on interactions and interfaces uh, and input devices for, uh, for our augmented reality and virtual reality efforts. Um, in particular, I think there's three challenges that my, uh, my groups are focused on, three core challenges that are facing uh, the, the, the future of AR and VR, especially in the, in the interaction side. The first challenge is in input and output devices. We really need good interaction devices to, to um, gather the full dexterity of our hands to really bring that into um, AR and VR. Uh, and these devices need to be all day wearable. Um, they need to be um, unobtrusive, but also really powerful. So there's lots of sensing challenges. There's lots of haptics challenges that are in that domain. Uh, the second area is in the AR space in particular, the, the whole uh, interface is going to depend on really just being contextualized to a much higher degree. We need to understand much more about the environment. We need to understand what the user is doing in the environment and how it's behaving. So we're doing a lot of stuff in contextualized AI, especially in HCI AI interactions in that space. And the third one is we need a fundamentally new interface. Uh, we need what I'm, what I'm calling a adaptive user interface, completely adaptive to the environment. In other words, we cannot really script applications in the same way that we do for phones or existing interfaces. We really need to rethink how we do that and how to compose them on the fly and how they interact, how they enable people to achieve uh, new great things uh, in AR and VR space. So uh, fundamentally, those are the areas that uh, I'm working in and the teams that I direct are working in and super excited to be on this panel. Thanks. Thank you. Bakri? 
My name is Valkyrie Savage. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Copenhagen. Um, I work a lot on fabrication, uh, but I'm really interested in it not just from the perspective of we make stuff. I'm also interested in the dexterity of hands and how we can use them to make the best possible input devices, uh, but physical ones. Um, a lot of my work has focused on sensing uh, as well, um, sensing the way that people interact with these things and so forth and so on. But uh, I'm just really interested in the way that the physical world has so much messiness. There's all of these things that exist that we would never bother to simulate if we were deciding what to simulate. Um, but those are the kind of interesting material properties and so forth that we can really use to make like optimal, fascinating input devices. Uh, I also like the idea that my reality doesn't have an uptime. Thank you. Question? All right. <clears throat> <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Huai Shu Peng, as you can see here. I'm an assistant professor uh, in the computer science department at the University of Maryland College Park. And my lab is called Small Artifacts Lab, or Smart Lab. Uh, and you can see from, from the name, like we're really interested in building things, small things, things that can wear, can put in your pocket, or things uh, that you can carry out. And if you switch to the next slides, uh, we're interested in fabricating a lot of things, uh, things that people can design uh, by themselves, and the design process may sometimes also combine with augmented or virtual reality. If you can move on to the next slides. So this is one example. You can actually design something that can hold in your hand its physical things, but maybe the AR or VR is part uh, of assisting of the design process. So that's the things we're working on. Awesome, thank you. Oh, Patrick, and at this point, we can split the screen. So I'm a professor at Hasselblad Institute after uh, a couple of years at Microsoft Research in Xerox Park. Um, I'm very interested in the topic of uh, fab versus virtual reality. These are a couple of the wonderful people I've been working with in the past couple of years on fabrication. I'm very interested in the combination of fabrication with, with fast interactive rates. So we spend a lot of time building mechanisms, uh, such as this uh, metamaterial mechanisms with Alex together. Uh, who is at, at CMU now. Uh, we've been uh, looking at how to interact with these things in real time um, by op operating them as machines. Um, the second video would show you a couple of seconds uh, from a video with, by, uh, that I did together with uh, Rob uh, Kovac. And uh, we've been looking at large scale fabrication, but also at animating these things. So you might have seen um, the, the dinosaur demo at WIST. Um, we created like a five meter dinosaur that is actuated using, uh, using pneumatics. And um, so we're both interested in fabricating the memory quickly as well as actuating when we get there. And the last little bit of video is one uh, together with Stephanie, who's also co author on this panel here today, um, where we're kind of deforming things in real time. So as the user's hand is moving up and down, you see how, how a uh, pet material plastic is deformed. So that's something that, that, that we put a lot of work into interactive fabrication getting to the point where you can fabricate, well, at least influence things in real time. I'm very excited about the idea of fabrication, getting to the point where we get interactive rates and, um, and kind of get some of the behaviors out of it that we hope to get from you know, digital media. Um, if you click to the next slide, yep. you'll see some of the people I've been working with, um, Sebastian, uh, Pedro Lopez, uh, Long Pan Cheng, um, all, like also the uh, former PhD students, and we've been working on the opposite side of which, which is like, well, what is missing on the VR side? And that would be haptics. So um, the next video you would see would be a video from Long Pants from a couple of years ago at WIST uh, called Turk Deck, uh, where users in virtual reality doesn't normally, in, doesn't inherently feel anything, but then there's 10 people running around with boards con orchestrated by a computing system, uh, allowing these people, which we call human actuators, to produce um, the physical reality that the person in VR would require to actually experience the room as if it were physical. And the last video snippet would be um, together with Pedro Lopez. And um, uh, we use electrical muscle stimulation. Here's a VR scene, a person running around in VR with 16 sets, sets of electrodes in the body um, on various parts of the arm and the shoulders. And, you know, some sort of a mix between haptics and electroshocking, I guess, um, where we are producing uh, the effect of actually lifting uh, heavy boxes and so on by actuating uh, users uh, opposing muscles um, to kind of produce an effect. So I'm very excited to be on this panel. 
one of my personal hypotheses is that these two fields will actually merge in the future into one. We're very excited here as a plot Institute to kind of figure out what are the elements that are missing that we need to put in for these to actually happen. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Pat. Um, as a reminder, two minutes for <laughs> the self-introductions. <laughs> Yeah, Michael. Yeah. Thank Hello, you. I'm Michael Nebeling. Um, I'm an, uh, an assistant professor at the University of Michigan. Um, and so I've been working on ARVR things since uh, 2016, so relatively new. Um, and I was fascinated initially by enabling um, physical prototyping as a way of generating um, the, uh, kind of like pre visualizing ARVR experiences. So I've done a lot of uh, work there, and um, I think there should be a photo of me that is in, from my recent um, courses where I try to teach and bring in like the physical world into some of my own teaching using virtual reality. Here's a mixed reality capture of that. So I also like Patrick. I believe that these technologies will coexist, and and I think we should do more to enable them in, in, for example, in some of our interface design approaches of the future as well. And I'll stop there and I look forward to this panel. Awesome, thank you. All right, so let's start the panel. Um, you can send your questions on Hub or um, by going to this link, tinyurl.com slash Kai question as we ease into the discussion. Um, so I will start with my own questions. So these days, you can buy a polished VR headset, like Quest 2, for as low as $300. Um, and it's very easy to set it up and use it. I have one, and I love it. However, if you wanted to buy a 3D printed for that price, uh, for you know 300 bucks, it's going to be a very finicky printer, and it will probably not work at first unless you do a lot of manual calibration and debugging. Um, so my first question is, do you think this is related to the evol uh, e evolution timeline of these tools? Because um, as I mentioned, the first 3D printer was invented 20 years after the first video headset. So is it safe to say that in 20, 30 years, we will see much more affordable, seamlessly working printers? <laughs> I hope so. Um, I think what we certainly see today is that the um, I think the transition between the different phases of a product is, is not a continuous one. So I think a, a great thing about virtual reality is that a couple of years ago, we kind of essentially took that transition from, from um, industrial use and kind of tech enthusiast use to something that's really consumer ready. And when you look at this, I mean, motion capture, which is part of this, I guess, used to be something in the range of, I, know, I mean, 150,000 maybe to get like decent motion capture working in the in the lab. And now that was 800 bucks, and now it's like 350 bucks or something, including the whole headset somehow. And um, I think when it comes to fab, we're still like one stage below that. We're like in the tech enthusiast phase, which machines are available, but these are not consumer machines, right? So FDM printer, it's just a miracle that, I mean, if you look at the construction, that the thing actually doesn't see what it's doing for like, the entire time you might print something overnight and you might it might completely fail in the process um, that certainly suggests to me um, that that hasn't happened so the interesting question is if you think 50 years out if you give uh, print 3d printing another 50 years what could that printer look like that would actually work reliably i would assume that it at least has closed loops so it looks at what it's doing itself i wouldn't be surprised if we had a completely different fabrication technology compared to like say fdm or something like that Oh, can I add it to that? Yes, of course. Uh, I mean, 2K might be a lot for a 3D printer or compared to the VR headset. But if you see the price of a 3D printer maybe five, six, seven years ago, that would be 10K or even even uh, much higher than that. So you do see the price of 3D printers getting much uh, lower than before. And there's a different printing methods come to that. Uh, some of the SLA printer, uh, SLA printer um, costs about $200, $300. The printing quality is pretty good. And I agree it's not designed for consumer, yet they still need some of the tweak, uh, uh, tinkering of the printer. Uh, but that, to me, is the user interface level or user experience level. Uh, and it's not the technical barrier to, to get to stage. All right, awesome. Do you guys want to add anything? or? Sure. Uh, I, <clears throat> I'll admit that I actually don't own a printer for myself. I have printers in my lab, but I don't have one at home because I think they're horrible. Um, but the, the thing is that I feel like in the future, printers don't have to be personal. Like, even the ones in my lab, which are shared by 30 to 40 people, are not busy all the time. 
I mean, I, I view like the future of 3D printing not as like a thing that we do at home, but as like a, essentially like a public utility sort of thing. If any of you have read The Diamond Age, that's very much like in line with sort of how I imagine 3D printing evolving is like, there are places you can print things and then you have them. I, I guess I'll chime in. I, I think fundamentally, whether we're gonna see this or not, to me, depends on uh, whether supply chain economics is gonna win or not. I, I think we are very rapidly approaching a world where you can get anything that's currently created in the world, mass produced and delivered to your door in less than two hours. Uh, which is far faster than printing it, especially if you consider the complexity of the thing that you get, right? You can get a really highly complex thing that has many different materials, lots of compu computation, lots of stuff inside that's designed by, by people who actually know how to design things. Um, it's delivered to your door in two hours. So I think that cycle is going to be increasingly improving. I mean, maybe not in, in terms of a minutes, but like it's getting there. So in terms of the obstacle to getting a thing to you really fast, I think that that one, I, I'm guessing it's gonna be a big hurdle for the digital fabrication side. I think that the, the where most of the applications that I see them are currently also identified is actually in the manufacturing space, like d designing highly complex, co highly complex things in that space. And I think that's where we're gonna see probably a lot of the the movement towards uh, better and bigger digital fabrication tools and, and tooling and, and devices. But then your thing is just like everybody else's thing. Yeah, I, so maybe you're saying it's the personalization is that the, the answer. But I, I, for me, that seems like it's an area where you need a lot of uh, skill to actually be able to do that. Well, I don't think so. I mean, you can design personalization, right? Like you can imagine a sort of future where you wave your fingers around and you get some measurements done and then it gets encoded into your device. Like a designer can create that personalization template essentially for you. The, the end user doesn't need to know how to do that, I don't think. Do you have to print that at home or do you, can you just get that delivered in an hour? If, if Amazon wants to print it for me and deliver it, I'm cool with that. <laughs> I, me too. That's what I'm saying, yeah. Um, I have a different version of that. Um, I think there's a, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, oh. <laughs> we have this delay in the line, so it's tricky. Okay, let me just, um, I, I like this discussion of like Amazon versus Fab, and I think I'm, I'm also thinking that I think Amazon has a, has a pretty good stake in this. Um, I think it's interesting to see how the digital work has panned out somehow. And with, with the advent of the World Wide Web, one would have thought that you would get a lot of personalization, everyone would get something different somehow. But if you look at how it's been going since, I think, I think one of the things that we'll be watching is, is mass taste versus uh, individualization. And on the digital side, I'm not sure which, which side is winning right now. Right? I would love, I would, personally, I would love to see a world of individualists and everyone gets their custom things. But there's also a possible future where like mass production will win and mass taste will win at the same time, which I'm pretty sure none of us on this panel are really excited about to see, but which might be a reality nonetheless. Patrick misses GeoCities. <laughs> GeoCities, right. <laughs> awesome. So my next question is actually for Michael. Um, you know, in my intro, I talked about the ultimate display and how a perfect 3D printer or a perfect uh, VR headset could be the ultimate display one day. Um, what are currently the biggest obstacles in uh, VR and AR towards creating the ultimate display? Yeah, it's certainly a lot on, I, I see challenges on both the hardware side and then also on <laughs> the kinds of content we actually create. Uh, personally, I'm more familiar with the the software side of things, and maybe Banco can comment a little bit more on the hardware. So uh, I guess we would agree that uh, tracking has improved, resolution is, is constantly improving, and on the VR side at least, we have devices at an affordable price that um, come close maybe to that vision of that ultimate display. It did, it did include, um, I guess, the idea of forming matter, and uh, so uh, I guess that's where these two fields could, could blend in nicely. So if I could, like, pick up any object from a virtual shelf in VR and then somehow produce it if it's a physical thing and it, it, it can become a controller or something, I think uh, that would be awesome. Um, so if we could actually materialize uh, some of the objects we see in VR. I think haptics is probably, at least a lot of people at WIST and Kai are excited 
about um, haptics uh, as a way of improving uh, virtual reality. Um, so yeah, I I, want, I think these are so. In summary, I think I, I talked mostly about the harder side. On the softer side, I, yeah, I think it would also be good if you could see more useful experiences. So I mean, there are not a lot of reasons to spend a lot of time in virtual reality or in augmented reality uh, these days. And I think we were just going around us and asking how much time have we actually spent in, in total. So I've never actually spent a, a work day in virtual reality. Uh, and uh, and the, the time to use augmented reality is also very limited. I think it has to do partly with not a lot of useful applications other than maybe fitness <laughs> and some simulation at this point. Um, so I wonder um, what needs to happen on the content side to fulfill this vision of the ultimate uh, display. Yeah, really good points. Um... Thank you. Uh, Benko, would you like to add to that? Sure, I think you would like me to add to that. Uh, <laughs> uh, OK. Um, I think the obstacles. Obstacles. I think there are many. Um, first of all, I think um, the way I think about the future, I don't think about them as VR, AR. I think about them as a kind of convergence device. I, I, I really think that most of the useful all-day wearable applications are actually in the AR space. Um, and we are still quite far from, from really mass uh, market valuable device in that space. Um, I, I think once you get to the point where you can fundamentally augment what you are seeing with different capabilities and really contextualize this and personalize this to your experience, you get a fundamentally transformative experience. Um, that's what I, I, that when I think about kind of the next computing platform, I really think about that. I really think about a hyper personal device that is that is very adaptive, that is uh, that is actually augmenting your capabilities. Um, now to get there, I think we still have so much work to do. Um, I think you know everything from displays, of course, having to get brighter, thinner, lighter, uh, more wider field of view. There's a lot of obstacles there. But for this community, I, I actually think that fundamentally. One of the biggest challenges that we're facing is we have to rethink the interface to, to these devices. Um, it is not anything that we're used to right now. And I, I, I don't think that people quite grok the, how, how different the experience is. Um, think about designing applications where you don't know how the application, application is going to look at render time. Right, it, it's it's a it's a fundamental challenge of the experience. Uh, you can design a capability, but how it's presented, how it's composited, when it's shown, to what degree it's there, how it's presented, and how long it, the person sees it is actually out of your control. For many reasons, uh, one of the most benign one is just safety. You oftentimes have to control it so that you don't fall down the stairs, right? Like you you have to you have to think about it fundamentally there. So I think some of the fundamental challenges is for us to actually rethink how we design applications, how we design the interface, how do we leverage this experience to create something that's hyper personal to you. Because I think the true value, right? Um, Michael talked about like, you know, there's not that much value in there. I would say, you know, we can debate the, the value of Beat Saber and how many hours people spend in it. I think it's a great application. But I think fundamental value to, to humans to uh, as a new computing platform is going to come when you have these hyper-personal devices, the ones that, that are really, um, that are understanding you and your environment, and then giving you the right information at the right time in the right place. Um, we're, we're far from that, but I think that's the exciting part. That's where we get, have a chance to actually define. Um, can I ask questions? Yes, Go ahead. OK. Uh, do you think screen will disappear in the future? Or desktop, where everything we do will be one I, version of Google? -Go? I think screen is a delivery method. So I, th I think it's a it's a. It's an option. I don't see right now a, a, a really better option in terms of the contender for delivering that kind of information to you than a personalized screen. Uh, but I've worked a lot in, in concepts of like spatial augmented reality with like many different projectors. How, how you deliver that information, I think, is an open question as well. I, I do think that personalized screens are, a, from physics perspective, from lots of different perspectives, from in install perspective, is it's uh, is a very likely outcome uh, that that there's a lot of momentum towards optimization, but I don't think it's the only way. I actually think that a lot of applications uh, can be done purely through audio channels, right? Like audio augmented reality is a, a, a real thing, and I think we sh we need to explore that as well. But I think holy grail is a the full vision. Awesome.
Thank you. So uh, I'd like to ask a similar question for fabrication um, to Valkyrie, actually. Um, what do you think are the, uh, the current biggest challenges uh, in 3D printing or laser cutting or other fabrication methods to creating the ultimate display? Well, uh, the, the fact that you started off your first question by explicitly saying how terrible 3D printers are doesn't, uh, you know, that, that suggests a potential barrier um, between us and the ultimate display. There is also a question of like how, okay, there's a question of how fast they can go. There's a question of materials. Um, there's also a question of, I guess what I would call like tricks we can do with the printer. Sort of like we're not material scientists and we're not um, building these machines ourselves as HCI experts, but we're kind of looking at like ways we can exploit what we already have. So, so thinking about these like peculiarities of their functionality and how we can how we can use that to render things that are interesting, um, I think is is a potential area that we can look at. Um, in terms of materials, I mean there is like functional materials is something that we're just starting to see. Like you know, flexible materials have become really popular, and conductive materials, and there's some use of uh, you know. Um, magnetic materials or uh, or other exotic things, thermochromic things and clear things and so forth. And um, of course, as that diversity increases, then we'll start to see more and more potential applications. And we're, we're a little bit far from being able to render every piece of reality with a 3D printer. In terms, <laughs> Benko is chuckling at me. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, there's, there's some things that we as HCI researchers just need to wait for in order to get to, uh, to where I think we can do the ultimate display. But, but for us as the kind of researchers we are, the kind of technologists that we all seem to be, like, I think that there's, yeah, just, right. just playing around and, and doing these tricks, I think, is, is what we need um, right now. Yep, I agree. Patrick, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I think the, it might be good to think about what this is going to look like. And I think if we take uh, VR, and AR and FAB, as well as Ubicomp, Smart Matter, and like all these other areas that essentially have the same objective if you think about it, right? I mean, there's this, I mean, Ubicomp has this idea of surrounding you. If you go, go back to the idea that were smart rooms and mobile kind of were part of that. And um, the idea is to surround you with computing, if you will. And, um, and if you think of that, I think, if you think that that's the vision somehow, that you are, that rather than you um, interacting with computing through, you know, like a 13-inch screen or something like that, that computing surround you and immerses you somehow, um, and everything is real time and all these things, then you can think of every one of these technologies and kind of ask yourself, well, how much is missing? So in VR, I think VR is certainly the closest when it comes to frame rate, right? So um, it's 75 frames so at every one per second. That seems to be working very well. And in FAP, obviously, the biggest drawback right now, I think, is the speed. Um, at the same time, it's, it would be interesting to also look at people look at smart matter, which have this, you know, at least the, the I think for them, the resolution is missing, right? They, they talk about molecular control, but in reality, they're looking at like they, they made 50 molecules, you know, and the molecules are like the size of a hand somehow. Um, so if you think all this coming together, I think uh, certainly very fast fabrication or very fast ability to modify might be one of the factors. Awesome. Um, so my next question will be, uh, actually, uh, thanks for submitting a lot of great questions, uh, so many questions coming, coming in. Um, so one question actually Udai is asking, uh, what would be a cool collaboration of FAP and a mixed reality on collaboratively achieving the ultimate display by complementarily overcoming their disadvantages. I actually have had a really similar question. Um, you know, with Roma, you know, your uh, project, Kwasho, um, you showed like how AR can help design CAD models as a 3D printer is fabricating the object. Um, so what kind of, yeah, other like collaboration opportunities do you see and like, uh, for instance, could it go the other way too? Like uh, maybe um, some fabrication tools can help AR, VR folks uh, better achieve their goals? What do you think? Right, uh, so 
The Roma system is the one that you can put on an AR headset, sort of, and you can sort of see the real world. And you can design 3D models with the feedbacks, uh, visual feedbacks in, in, in augmented reality. And uh, we have a robotic arm that's sort of champion and actually print the things you just designed in a sort of wireframe models. Um, what's, uh, what the system added to uh, the pure augmented reality system is the the physicality is the things that you can actually hold in your hand after you finish the design. So that's something I think that's unique when you think about combining augmented reality with um, 3D printing or with fabrications. Uh, in, in, in one sense, if you think about that, if you extrapolate this a little bit, uh, if an augmented reality is perfect, that not just rendering the visual feedbacks, but also the haptic feedbacks, uh, to a really high degree of freedoms and high resolutions. You can actually s feel all the things you just designed with your hand. Maybe you don't need the fabrication side for that. On the other side, if you think about fabrications will be instantaneous, you can always just feel and th have the things printed in your hand. Uh, if you don't like it, you can just actually change or edit the physical matters. So that's uh, Patrick showed the, the, the free form editing of the, the matters. That's actually the, the other versions or the other side of, um, of augmented reality. Um, to combine this two, it's sort of what we're doing right now because either of them is perfect at this moment. We don't have the instant, instantaneous uh, rapid uh, update of the speed of the fabrications. We don't have all these materials that can print to make super complex things. For example, you can print things that can change its shape it's probably difficult, it might, you might be able to print some of the circuit traces. You won't be able to print the chip in a very easy way. So that's something we don't have. Uh, on the augmented reality side or virtual reality side, uh, you have data gloves, you have different kind of happy feedbacks, uh, vibrations or pneumatics or hydraulics. That won't give you the sensations I have actually hold things with my hand. So that's what I see if you try to combine augmented reality and virtual reality with fabrication at this moment, that's something we can explore to sort of compensate each other, right? Like try to meet in the middle. One thing that I think is interesting is uh, some of the work that even that Benko has done in terms of like essentially tricking people by changing their visual, um, the, their yeah, by, by fooling their visual perception in VR. Like the idea that we could use that to fabricate imperfect stuff and uh, just convince people that it's actually the right thing. I think that figuring out that is something really interesting because fabrication is, you know, wasteful in some sense. Like we don't want to print 800,000 little objects to like have um, to, to play with in our headsets. But, but the idea that we can actually like turn one thing into another thing using uh, these displays and by replacing people's reality, I think is also an interesting idea. Yeah, I just want to give a shout to Mari Asmandiana if he's in the audience or he's heard he's here at the conference. He's the one who actually did that work on haptic retargeting. Mm -hmm. I also agree. That's it's a very um, it, it, when it, it it comes to mind like it, repurposing reality or basically re, like is is a really interesting concept. Um, I wonder if you guys have any, uh, of course, on the team fabrication. I, f I wonder <laughs> if you guys have uh, have any thoughts about the actual sustainability aspects of of printing things on demand, continuously printing in reality. I mean, one of the things that I think it's one of the most awesome things about the AR VR future is the fact that um, it is it not only can it render reality or you know virtual reality but you can do things that are supernatural the things that you cannot print the things that you cannot experience the things that are suspended in midair things that are that that are just pure impossibilities if you're constrained to physics right and um so how do you like you know and also from sustainability perspective like you you are using some electricity but mostly the other stuff is there so i'm curious how you guys how how you are thinking about that aspect of the of the of the digital fabrication on demand even if it's instantaneous. I, I am not going to claim that we'll print you a new physics. But uh, in terms of sustainability, I guess like print, printed stuff is embodied carbon, right? So like while you have your headset turned on, you're constantly using electricity. And like that is what's sustaining your reality. Whereas with a printer, 
uh, depending how long you're going to use the thing, like you make it one time and then it's still there, even if you lose power, even if, you know, you don't have a headset on and you look at my thing, like it's still there for you. Um, it's created once and it lasts, uh, which can be useful for some objects, but not for others. I see Patrick has his hand up and I'll point at him in one second. Um, but the, yeah, I mean, I mean, and there is work on like, are these materials sustainable and so forth? I don't know if we as HCI researchers are 100% equipped to answer that question, but um, yeah. some, some form of reuse I think is possible with these devices. Right, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe one minute follow up and then one minute follow up from Patrick. Okay. Yeah. All right, let me just say one sentence. So uh, what I'm thinking is like maybe in the future that 3D printing is not always like just reprint the things. Like you have the matters you can just add it itself. Self assembly. Or, or, or you, have a, you, have, you have a cup, you can actually reshape it to whatever you want. You don't always need to reprint the things. So that sort of um, overcome the, um, the sustain, uh, sustainability thing uh, in, in, in one way. I agree. Yeah, Patrick? I think the, um, I'm wondering if we can draw some inspiration from computing where this idea <laughs> of having hierarchies of caches, for example, has been a concept for a very long time. <coughs> so we would typically, in computing, you would do something very quickly, but then you would have very little of it. For example, you access a register or something like that, or first level cache or something like that. And then uh, on the back end, you would have something, well, in the extreme case, you would have tape, right, which is a very slow to access thing. And somehow over the decades, we figured out clever mechanisms of making these things work together, where we get like very fast response from from uh, you know um, RAM and first level caches and stuff like that, and and then over time when we have the time we kind of go out to like disk and tape and so on, and uh, I don't know what that would look like for Fab, but I could imagine in some ways. I mean, I think what 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 you know what the other people on the panel said a minute ago that this could ultimately add up to some sort of VR being some sort of the first level cache to something that that and Fab being some sort of the back end to. I love that metaphor. Great. Um, so um, next, we're going to talk about alternative fu uh, futures. But um, before we transition to that, um, one question to uh, Benko and Michael, and you guys hopefully can answer this really quick. There's a lot of excitement around AR, VR, and you know, mixed reality these days. And many people think that we're going through a hype cycle and that the excitement will die out soon. So how do you uh, respond to this sort of people? Is your question, is the AR VR hype? Okay, just checking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I don't believe so. I, I actually, I, as, as I said before, I believe that if you look at computing, um, we have had several different iterations of what is the dominant computing platform. Um, I do believe that the next dominant one will be the AR VR space. Um, I, I just don't see anything else on the horizon that has the potential to fundamentally transform how we interact with digital information. It's not just with like recreating physical things and recreating you know experiences, but actually just really how do we consume information? How do how do we uh, live with that information and how is that embedded in our daily lives? I think the next platform for that is going to be wearables. It's going to be AR VR technologies. Um, so from that perspective, I don't believe this is a hype. I, I think fundamentally this is what's on the horizon. Um, but the, the right questions are really around the, the areas of like how long is it going to take and when are we going to get there and things like that. And, and some of it is still like we have to solve some fundamental real big challenges. We talked about it, right? So, so it's going to take some time. But the, the industry is, if, if you're thinking about this, I think from the industry perspective, there's very large uh, investments and also very large uh, groups of people are now working on these problems to actually try to address this, which is something that kind of gets it out of the hobbyist space and into in, into a kind of a real user value space. Uh, and I think that's the most encouraging parts about it because at, at this point we're really getting um, large amounts of investments to to make that real. Yeah, got it, Michael. 
Um, I'm with Team Banco here, and I also think we can already see how some of these technologies are transforming uh, several fields. So I work in education, and um, uh, one of the things we do at the University of Michigan is a bigger XR initiative where we're really trying to identify good uh, courses and instructional materials where using AR via uh, makes a lot of sense. And I think, um, so it, it, it comes with a lot of challenges. So I think we are all early adopters. <laughs> the way we think about these technologies, there's not a lot of instructors that are ready to do it, but yet there are a few who see the potential. And I, I, I kind of like, it, it just like look at computer rooms. So when I was a student, we had to go to a specific computer room in order to access these things. So now we build these VR computer rooms uh, here at Michigan. And, uh, and a lot of students already have these devices at home. And I think it will be like a smartphone one day. Uh, uh, and there will not be just one device. There will be all kinds of devices for different purposes. But I think they will be bearable. It's, I agree with Benko there. And I think they will be very powerful. And nobody will ever question this <laughs> again. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> all right. Um, I do love your question. It, it was a great question. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, so quick break question um, to the panelists. Raise your, your hand if you own a 3D printer. At, 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 at your home. Oh, yeah? OK. So two. Oh, wow. OK. Uh, raise your hand if you own a VR headset at, in your home. <laughs> so, OK, OK. I'm a Luddite. OK. Cool. OK, just, you know, uh, statistics. Um, I also want to ask <laughs> the audience, uh, can you guys, um, can you folks raise your hands if you uh, own a 3D printer? OK. I should take in your home, yes. Oh, yeah, OK. You're not, not, your hand. Up. not in your lab at home. What's that? <laughs> it's a biased audience. Oh, biased yes. audience, yeah, for sure. <laughs> OK, and yeah. now Not a representative sample here. VR, VR headsets. Do you want to take another picture? Yeah, That's the, the same group. We, we're going to have to <laughs> overlay these two pictures. Yes. Yeah, yeah, OK. Just for statistics. Do you want to spell this out for us? We don't see anything. Can you tell us? Uh, uh, yes. We'll send you the pictures. Yeah, you're good. It, okay. It's a fair I'll... amount of uh, the audience from both cases have raised their, yeah. their, their hands. Okay. Yeah, I'd say 60, 70 percent. So next topic, um, next chapter, alternative futures. Um, my first question will be, as technology becomes more affordable and compact, will there be an advanced desktop 3D printer or laser cutter or like some sort of advanced ma manufacturing machine in every home in the future? And uh, perhaps Valkyrie, you can go first. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to reiterate that I don't think there will be. I, uh, I just think that that kind of machine is not going to be, I mean, it, if you imagine a future where like these things print our food or something, like maybe you would use it enough to make it worth it. But otherwise, like I, I don't, I, if, while we are a consumer society and everybody loves stuff, I just don't think that like the average person will need so much new stuff that they need to make it themselves at their home. Personally, I I I, I don't agree. Oh. <laughs> uh, so, um, how many of you have a kitchen in your house or in your room? <laughs> right. And how many of how 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 many of you cook or order food? delivery, go to restaurant. Sometimes. Right. So what I think maybe in the future the 3D printer, well, maybe it's not called 3D printer anymore. It's some of the machine. But if you're talking about the, 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 the future, right, that will be the things that can actually print or make the things that you want. Uh, just like you have something in the kitchen. You can, of course, order food and deliver it to you. But if you want, you can also create a make by your, uh, your own version. So that would be something just like a kitchen or a stuff or oven in your room or in your house. You, you might not use that all the time, but it would be nice to have that. I don't know. I like this whole thing of like there's car shares and stuff, right? I mean, people have recognized that even the things that we do buy now, we just don't use enough to like justify. Like, I mean. I mean, I mean one version of that is like if you have the machines, you're not going to need all the deliver all the deliveries or for fabricated things. What you need to order to your house or home will be the raw material. 
uh, that would be genetic raw material just fit into the machine and you can print. And that actually saved the energy and saved the delivery in one sense or not. Can I offer a perspective from sure. a yeah, team AR VR? Yeah, one, one minute. Because no, it's going to be less than one minute. Okay. I, <laughs> uh, I actually, my hypothesis is that we might have something like 3D printers at homes in the future for us. We will never ever think of them or call them 3D printers. It will be super specific. It'll be just like your food processor or you know a stand mixer. You don't call that a application device for stirring matter it is uh you know it has a KitchenAid brand on it it's branded and experience and you use it for specific type of things so maybe you know in the future i would guess that we might have something like a you know a fast manufacturing device or, or something if it's especially if it's related to food as a kitchen appliance but it probably will not be called 3d printer or it will be won't be you know it'll be branded thing. okay what about vr headsets will we Will everyone own a VR headset in the future? Uh, well, my prediction is that we will see a, a blurring line between what we call VR right now and AR right now, and you will not have a, a potentially dedicated VR headset in the far future. You will have personalized device that you wear that gives you augmentations in the world. It, it can block the world. It can create a VR experience or AR experience. I do believe we'll get there. I don't think the, I mean, for some, for some time we will live in a world where those are two distinct uh, areas and, and that's purely because of the, the nature of these devices and how they're manufactured and how the use cases are. Got it. Um, so my next question is for Michael. Okay. Oh, Patrick, okay, yes. Yeah, I think the, um, I, I love how we're talking about food processes because I think that might well be a, 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 you know, a, a key scenario. Um, I think it's interesting to see how some of these technologies, we start out by thinking of them very broadly. Um, I'm thinking of tabletop computing right now. And initially, I think some people, like we didn't know what it would be good for, right? And so I remember, um, I think one of the people behind the Diamond Touch decided to do all his uh, uh, document processing, you know, Word and so on, on the tabletop computer. But ultimately, now a couple of years later, it seems that some of the early scenarios which had to do with like point of sales and so on, that they actually turned reality and many of these other scenarios we thought of did not turn into like a lasting uh, reality somehow. So um, I would assume also that we would see, um, you know, some of these more specialized scenarios. And in that sense, I think even though the panel talks about 3D printing, I think subtractive machines that actually can deal with, you know, like you could think of uh, laser cutters for that matter, I think might actually take over in that sense because they're good at processing stuff that's not like, doesn't look like astronaut food, for, ex for example. Um. <clears throat> Got it. Um, so yeah, going back to Michael, um, you know, we've been talking about AR, VR headsets and so on. Do you think um, the, um, you know, Quest 2, right, for, for VR, right, it's like pretty good uh, device. Um, and we see that you know, you know all these products start are starting to look very similar in their form factor. Do you think AR headsets and VR headsets have reached their final form factor? Oh, <laughs> I hope not. Uh, so right now they're they're pretty pretty clunky. They, uh, so you know, one of the things I wanted to say that I forgot in my introduction, we put up the picture of me teaching with a VR headset. I think in 50 years from now, people will look at this and it'll feel like uh, when we look at the grayscale kind of like movie from the from the 50s or whatever. So I think um, no, I, I think uh, these devices will look uh, very different. I'm, I'm strong, uh, I'm very personal. And and I think also in a line with some of the um, questions in the Q&A, I think they will look very, very different, these VR headsets. Hopefully they will be adapted to people with different vision capabilities and maybe motor abilities. And they will be, they will probably be more like fashion and maybe they'll, they'll be branded, I don't know. <laughs> in any case, I don't think that we have reached uh, the final form factor. I do think it will be uh, something that is always available and um, uh, and and that we can we, we put on our eyes somehow or through some kind of uh, contact lenses or some other possible features. Um, there will probably also be spaces that are just augmented, maybe without. Um, they provide a public view, like we have public spaces now, and then maybe when you enter them with with your more personal device, maybe that brings a different value that allows you to see some of these things and differently. Um, 
Uh, yeah, I wonder what Banker would say, but I would say he did a good job on the quest too, but I think we can still do a little better. <laughs> well, well, thank you. I think that very personally. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, the answer that, that I would say is, is no. Uh, I, I think anything that you have to wear for a full day, I mean, look at us, right? Like we we're technically have the ability to buy exactly the same piece of clothing, but that's one of the defining characteristics that we all do, which we express ourselves through what we wear. So any wearable device, and I consider this, I consider AR, VR future to be highly wearable, um, uh, is going to have to be fashion forward. So form is going to matter quite a lot, and how you how you look and how you express is going to matter quite, quite a lot. Um, so uh, you, I think we will see, right now we're still on the technology trying to actually get to the capabilities to get to the value. Uh, once, you know, once we start seeing that, I think we will see a great differentiation in, in, in that aspect. Great. Awesome. So, yeah. Um, yeah, we've been talking about very nice possibilities, uh, but just in the scope of, like, alternative uh, futures, uh, you know, let's assume that everyone owns a, you know, VR headset that does look like a VR headset that we have these days, right? So, like, and uh, what would that sort of future look like? Would we live in a very tiny space, you know, uh, a very small room, and we just, like, sit there with a the headset on or, like, maybe use redirected walking to feel like we live in a bigger house and we never need to, we never need to go out and, like, our, like, 3D printer can make us food? And, like, like what, kind, what, what does that future look like? And, like, uh, how can we work in a way that you know we are, we are aware of like more negative possibilities and how can we be more responsible as we develop tech <coughs> how do we make sure that our fallback reality doesn't suck is that what exactly you're yeah okay. <laughs> Patrick would you like to oh, start like or? <laughs> <laughs> I like my fallback reality yeah. that was a great term Valkyrie that's a uh, no, no, go ahead, Valkyrie. Take this one. <laughs> me? me? <laughs> <laughs> I was the proponent of the tiny houses. Uh, so uh, I was just thinking uh, about a lot about floor plans at the moment, uh, thinking about moving soon. And so what would be <laughs> in my house now and what would be in my house in the future? So maybe we'll have, I don't know whether we still value physical space the way we do now. Um, I mean, we can essentially create very large open-ended virtual reality spaces overlaid over the physical space. So um, I, I really wonder what it, what it looked like. Maybe we all live in tiny houses <laughs> and we make them look very, very large and um, uh, maybe accessible. I, 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 yeah, I think that's where this came from. Um, the, I, I just wonder how we value physical space, what we do to physical space and, and, and uh, how we perceive it and how we trust it. Um, so we'll probably double check everything, uh, but it could still be fabricated in real time. So we don't actually know what's there. Uh, yeah, very interesting uh, question. I don't actually, I, I think most of the movies that try to portray it end up in a very, very dark uh, future. And I think there's a real danger. There is a real danger that it might go there. So let's just preserve our fallback reality. Do that now, take pictures as you can. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I guess maybe I'm the optimist here. I I don't think we'll end there. I think there's very little chance that we'll we'll end there, uh, for a couple of reasons. One is, no technology fundamentally transforms our life to such degree that we remove any need for any physicality aspect, right? Like I think we haven't gone there. Maybe the ultimate extreme, right? If we're talking. Uh, you know, recreating every single sensory inf stream information to your body. At that point, I think that it gets very metaphysical. Like it gets very religious in some degree because at some point you're talking about what is reality. It is interesting how many of the VR solutions, for example, that we have today. So spatial, for example, is one that was created for meeting rooms. Uh, and to have like professional meetings. But when you think about how these things are actually used at the moment, they're used uh, to have wedding ceremonies, to, to do religious things together, to do all the kinds of things that they weren't actually designed for. And also like, I mean, I question, I th like I, it's cool that Benko is optimistic, but if he like, well, if you traveled from the 50s to 2022 and you, you spend some time at a bus stop, they had bus stops in the 50s, 
maybe they had newspapers, <laughs> uh, but I think people talked to each other and they didn't all just uh, you know stand there. And, uh, <laughs> so we created definitely behaviors that I think are um, not very nice. And, and so I wonder in, if you go 50 years in the future, will we all be, I'm not sure. I, I think I agree with Benko there. We won't all be standing there with our headsets and we will not, we will not talk to each other anymore. I think it'll be, it'll be part of our, of the things that we wear and we'll probably preserve hopefully some of the social interactions. So I actually uh, do think we'll be staring there with our headsets, <laughs> except that I don't think there will be in a dark room with, okay, okay. You know, like completely jacked into the, into the system <laughs> in the matrix. That that's not the future that I'm envisioning. I feel like we're actually, the future that I'm talking about is the future where these variable devices are uh, uh, prosthesis and they're helpers. They're augmenting your, your capabilities at, uh, continuously as you go through your life. They don't replace the need for physicality. They don't make your house. They don't do anything like that. But they do create an alternative augmented version, right? And and that's actually a really interesting capability. We're already seeing, I mean, right now you can argue uh, the online communities and online environments are actually fairly addictive and people spend a, a ton of time on, on these uh, uh, on, on these platforms uh, and live basically digital versions of their lives in a different way. Um, will some people want to go to that extreme? Probably. I mean, it's highly likely. But uh, mm -hmm. but is it is it likely that we will, as a society, transition to it? I, I don't think so. Right. Patrick, you've been patiently waiting. I don't know. Maybe you can. Chime. Yeah. So. <clears throat> I mean, a couple of, I guess, in, it, it's not recently, like two years ago, I first noticed how expensive wood has actually gotten. You know, I started I'm doing a homeworking project right now. And uh, it's kind of weird if you think about it. I mean, like many, many years ago, when, when we first started to kind of have things made from plastic, you know, plastic, I mean, if you think of the 50s or whatever, you know, when, when you know, mass produced plastic goods kind of entered the market and on a big scale, uh, these were kind of expensive things and the natural stuff was the cheap stuff. Now, you know, half a century later, um, wood is actually getting pretty expensive somehow. So if you if you think we are through to its logical conclusion, like in a hundred years or something like that, the question is like which of these two things will be expensive and which of these will be cheap? And I think it's not very hard to guess because it's already happening right now, essentially, where the the expensive part of VR is the space. Um, right? I mean you can do VR in like a square meter if you want to, but you can also do real walking with like, you know, and then the ultimate thing is like well, physical space, if you think of this backwards, let's imagine you live in a world, just for the matter of argument, that we're completely, everyone were in VR the whole time, then there would be a bunch of rich people who would afford to have a one purpose room somehow, and you know, had a pool table in there, something insane like that. And everyone's like, what are you doing there? It's like a room just for playing pool or like just for doing this or so. So I would, I could envision, and I guess that's a dystopian future somehow where, where actually VR does take over somehow, you know, because space is so expensive. And, um, and, um, and uh, the majority of people would actually, um, yeah, kind of just for, for, for efficiency reasons somehow use, you know, because it allows you to repurpose space. I don't like that future, but I think it's not completely unrealistic. I mean, even, even if that ends up being the future, right? Like even there, I, th I would argue that fundamentally in that case, if, if space is at such a premium and people are so tightly packed together, then maybe VR is the best thing that we can do because like at that point I would yeah. much rather live in the in the virtual environment that is much more spacious and much more furnished than than if if my real reality is 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 to that degree. I mean again I'm I, I believe that's a dystopian future, utopian future that I, I don't really believe it's likely. But even there I feel like there's clear benefits to to treating that as a, as then a virtual reality. Yeah, that future would not be caused by VR, right? So VR, it's not like VR causes that reality. That reality would be caused by something else. And yeah, I agree. I think VR might be, might be appreciated in, in that context. Yeah. We're going to go into the question. So uh, a question by uh, Jan Mankoff. What are your thoughts about whether AR, VR, or FAB are more able to include people with disabilities? Does that change if you think about authors versus users? Um, Valkyrie and Huayshu, would you guys like to start? Uh, I mean, even in terms of the keynote speaker's comments uh, regarding digital redlining and so forth, like it seems that 
a physical thing that can be shared is moderately more accessible at the moment to to various communities. Um, the it, it, okay, but that's not the accessibility question. The accessibility question. I mean, like you keep referring to augmented reality as a prosthesis, and I think that there are like, of course, physical analogs to that kind of stuff. Um, you know, they can like there can be devices that can be manufactured to make us better than we were, um, which is a a sort of uh, accessibility thing. In terms of designing, I think that like there's just not. The design tools are hard, and we definitely don't have good ones right now that are that are accessible. I think that the the sort of future that I waved my hands about was like where you can have these customization templates. I think would be would be an accessible future where where anybody can make something with fabrication. But uh, why you? Right. Um, and so I think that's like every time when we have some of the new technologies. It's become more popular and pervasive. Uh, we have to be careful that we're not leaving a um, group of people behind. Uh, so one thing we're thinking actually, so some of the things we're, well, let's say planning to work on is like for virtual reality, let's say. Once you have a headset, you can interact or social with other people. Um, because we're highly relied on the visual as a channel, uh, there are people's uh, blind users, for example, we're sort of leaving behind. Uh, so one of the possible future, let's say we, I, we all get into the virtual reality to socialize. Maybe we have the panels in virtual reality, we all have the headset. And how we can be inclusive and make sure that all the people can get on the, get on the platform, can communicate with, cha uh, with each other. And it's not because of their um, different cases that they cannot, they are, they are ex exclusive from the platform. I think that's kind of important. And I think that's not just speak, uh, for the platform develop uh, pl platform designers and also for the developers who build these systems or apps that keep that into the considerations. I mean, I don't have like systematic or ways to do that, but I think this is actually uh, for the first um, the first things to do at least to make sure make sure that I like people understand the importance of that. Right. Um, uh, so we have uh, only a couple of minutes left. If anyone wants to ask a question in person, feel free to raise your hand. So uh, the question I'm going to ask is uh, by Laura Devendorf. Does fabrication necessarily mean 3D printing? What other machi machines and ecosystems do you think have strong potential and should be explored? Uh, Patrick, would you like to answer this question? Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> I think, I mean, it might make sense to break them down into additive, subtractive, and and I mean, there's a, th these are the things we're thinking about today. And, and then Laura herself has done a lot of work of, of, of you know, variations of those where like including users, for example, which is a very interesting idea. Um, so I think, I think one of the drawbacks that we see in 3D printing today is not just, it's, it's very slow and it only uses, you know, materials that, that have gone through some sort of a liquid or, or, or powder uh, state. Which is which really limits what you can do. So um, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, kind of on the note of what we said earlier about specialized machines, that that um, subtractive technology might actually have an edge on some of these things, um, because it it just doesn't it, you know it kind of caters more to what we what we would see in our daily lives. So I would actually kind of be curious to hear what Laura has to say about it, for that matter, because I think she is, she's done a lot of good work in that space, and be curious to to see. I don't know if there's a, I, I don't see the room. I don't know if there's a way to, to give her a microphone. She right is now, so. yeah. shouting yeah. from out in the room. She's shouting, okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the microphone's coming. She likes shouting, though. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Um, I think I no, hear I you guess, through the window. Uh, um, no, I guess I was just thinking, uh, textiles feel like something that is really versatile and in people's homes and that they are already fabricating with maybe at the same rate or faster than a 3D printer. So, or even just kitchens, you know, we have a lot of manufacturing machines in the home and I'm always curious how we could adapt or sort of hyper power those um, as opposed to fitting them into sort of a workshop item that then comes into the home. So anyway. It, it does seem like a lot of the work on this right now is uh, 
is focused around these like very predictable materials, right? Like plastic and wood and so forth. And, and I like the idea of using like less predictable and messy materials like textiles or egg whites or whatever, right? Like these, just these weird things. I think that's a really interesting future. Anyone wants to ask any question in person? I'm gonna prioritize. But if not, I'm gonna keep asking the questions here. Um, so uh, Kathy Fang has a question. People don't want to fabricate everything, and neither do people want to spend all day in XR. Could you comment on the limited util utility for both? Uh, Banco, maybe you want to go first? I, I think we said a lot on that exact topic in this panel. I, I'm curious. I, I don't really have too much to add to that I, in terms of... I agree, people don't necessarily want to spend the entire time in there, but I also think that the devices that we're wearing, um, you know, particularly your cell phone, things like that, are, are devices that it has been proven that are basically on you all the time, that are part of, part of your, you know, existence and ecosystem. People have always, there's the famous, you know, experiments where like, would people give up their vacation days or their cell phone, mm. and people mostly pick their, you know, vacation days to give up and keep the cell phone, right? It's it's like it's really important to to us to keep that. So I I do yeah. think that there's a there's a you know there, there's there's aspects to that, that that these devices are going to be and that the avail av availability of this information is going mm -hmm. to be all day experience for for a lot of people. But <clears throat> I don't right. think that that's pre that precludes people from doing other things and not being just completely in virtual right, reality. Right. Also. Uh, did you guys? Did you I wanted to just say okay. one sentence, yes. which was that um, even to to dredge up Patrick's old comment that uh, I think finding the right handoffs and stuff is a really interesting HCI challenge for the future. Uh, one okay. sentence, yeah. So what I'm thinking is like the either VR, AR, or fabrication is not to replace the current reality, but to augment that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Patrick, yes, one sentence, two sentences. Yeah. So. So I think we should think of these as a free to optimal kind of set somehow. And <clears throat> I mean, PCs haven't gone away. We use them periodically. Laptops haven't gone away. We use them periodically. Mobile phones will not go away. We'll use them periodically. And I think VR, rather than saying VR is going to replace this or something like that, that has never really happened for that matter, right? Some technologies became obsolete, but everything that's free to optimal will stay around. And I would say that VR and mobile and laptops and so we are all Pareto optimal and fat for that matter may be Pareto optimal as well. And so they may just kind of form that Pareto optimal curve and then people might switch between these and maybe vacation hopefully is on that curve as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and lastly, there's a question specific to Meta. Um, so I want to give Benko a chance to uh, answer um, what are the main challenges for accessibility, I mean, similar question, accessibility in the metaverse, and how is meta working on these issues? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So um, I want to also tie this to Jen's question from before, right? I, first of all, I, I think that um, there's so much work that we need to still do in accessibility. Uh, I, I think that there's lots of opportunities to do that. Uh, I'm actually super excited to partner with Create Center at University of Washington to explore this topic even more and, and to, to start and jumpstart a lot more VR and AR accessibility work there. Um, I think the way that I think about it, um, in general, there are, there are kind of two camps for the accessibility story that, that are important. One is uh, to really just make the existing titles more accessible. Uh, you know, I, I equate that to kind of the curb cuts in the in the streets and things like that. There's lots of stuff that can be introduced in the interface to make it more generally accessible to the wider population. I think the fundamental opportunity that most people don't actually realize, that mo most people don't talk about, is the the fact that these devices ultimately, if they're going to be useful, and they need to be highly personalized. Uh, and I, what I mean by that is not personalized just in terms of the information that they give you, but also personalized in the capabilities that you can do. A lot of work that the, we do right now is, for example, with EMG and muscle sensing on the, the hand tracking and hand information, which is actually an interesting opportunity to not, not necessarily treat this hand as a you know, able-bodied hand that has five digits and like it looks a certain way and this is the hand tracking of today, but really be able to personalize the experience, personalize the input, personalize the output to the capabilities of that particular human, right? That's what I mean by really highly personalized experience. So I think we have lots of opportunities in the in the space to really push this idea forward and that's, that's kind of some of the work that we're doing right now at Meta. 
Awesome. Thank you so much. So yeah, the it's I guess uh, that's it. Uh, so to conclude, maybe everyone can say one sentence about what they're most excited about, um, you know, um, in terms of their research and in terms of like this panel, or perhaps the intersection of the two fields. Um, would you like to start, Harshu? Uh, just one sentence. Just one sentence. Yes. Um. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone wants to go first. I'll, I'll take the obvious one and say that I'm just excited that uh, you put this together. And this is like an interesting topic for us to think about and talk about together. I'm excited to continue working with the people on the stage and the people in this room to think through all of these big questions. Uh, all right. I got my one sentence. Uh, I, I, think, I think a lot, a lot of things we discussed today is trying to uh, really push the boundary and think about the extreme cases of either virtual reality or augmented realities. But as I said before, I think the, 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 the real future will be something in between, and it's not replacing what we're doing, but to get, to, 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 to get the reality better. All right. Um, I'll just repeat a little bit from what I said in my introduction. I think rarely do you have a chance to work on defining the next computing platform. Um, and I think we fundamentally have that chance right now to define how the, uh, how we interact with the next computing platform and what are the interfaces there. So if you're interested in that, come talk to me, join me. So I um, said in the beginning, I think that VR is, 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 has reached product phase and, and FAB has not. So I, I personally think it's, I'll be very cu curious to get the fabrication into the product phase and then compare again and see how that's all panning out. And I think there's a lot of, just to make this concrete, I think there are a lot of very concrete challenges that the HCI community can contribute to that actually uh, uh, allow us to make that transition from kind of a, a tech enthusiast, you know, not product to an actual product. So I think good things will happen in the next three to five years there. Well, maybe we'll do a follow-up panel at some point. Michael? Yeah, I, I, I'm also excited. I think one thing we need to highlight is this future needs the fabrication people or the, the hardware, let's say the hardware people work more closely with the AR VR software people. Oh, uh, one concluding comment, yes. Thanks, Andrew at Kern National Science Foundation. I just wanted to point out that as wonderful as this group of people is, that um, innovations in new computing platforms like the desktop and the mobile phone have come from designers working with people like the people you put together because of the role design can play in the generation of new ideas for how technologies can be used. And I think that's going to be really important in the platform of the future. I, I agree. And I also want to remark that we're all technologists and none of us are like equipped as social technologists. So there's like a lot of things that we can talk about that there, that well, there, there are a lot of things that we're not totally capable of talking about that, that are important to these futures. Yeah, that, that's a fair point. Uh, yeah, we can chat more after the panel, perhaps. I, I would love to, and, and thank, I mean, kudos for putting this together, great panel. Thank you so much, really appreciate it. Awesome, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, perhaps we can uh, have you. a picture with the panelists.